Greetings, everyone. Good afternoon. We are so happy to be seeing you all today as we are starting this inaugural session of The Guardian. This is a collective of chronologies that you can find on a beautiful website. And again, we want to thank you all, Immersive Ocean Inc., the nonprofit that's been assisting with this, Clearwater Baha'is, and most importantly, the presenter today, Violetta Zane. If you want to find this chronology that we're about to start discussion on, the whole description, everything, you can find it on theutteranceproject.com. Now, we're going to introduce our speaker, Ms. Violetta Zane. She is an artist and a graphic designer in Pointe Noire in the Republic of Congo. In 2020, Violeta Zane and Adib Masumian launched the Utterance Project, a YouTube channel, and a companion website, both dedicated to extolling the beauty of the original Arabic and Persian of the Baha'i holy writings with English subtitles and transliteration. World Languages is the companion YouTube channel it offers a smaller section of these holy writings in 38 languages from all continents, including Quechua, Amharic, Vietnamese, and Greenlandic. Violetta is a researcher, a writer, and speaker in the field of Baha'i history. She has given 21 talks at Clearwater, and this is found under the series title Storytelling Sundays. And she is also the author and illustrator of four illustrated chronologies. The first, The Blessed Beauty, The Life and Revelation of Baha'u'llah. The second, The Primal Point, The Life and Revelation of the Bab. The third, The Extraordinary Life of Abdul Baha. And the fourth, which we are starting today, The Guardian. The Life and Work of Shoya Effendi. We thank Violetta for being here. And again, a uh, uh, shout out again to Immersive Ocean and to the local Clearwater Baha'i community for making this venue available. Violetta, welcome. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is just, it's absolutely a joy to be with you today, all of you on Zoom, on Facebook Live, on YouTube. And I want to uh, I want to shout out to the countries and cities and states that you come from. We have people from Tampa, Florida, from Sweden. We have people from uh, Nor from Norway, from Denmark, from Canada, from Tucson, Arizona, from Bracknell in the United Kingdom, from France. We have several people from France. Uh, we have more people from Florida, from Virginia, from Quebec and Canada, from South Africa, from Dover, Delaware, my alma mater, University of Delaware, uh, from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, Alabama in the south of the U.S. Yes, it's Toronto, Ontario, and I think that's it. Welcome. All of these places I just listed are all gathered here today to hear about Shoghi Effendi, and we're going to do just that. Let me share my screen. Let me share my screen here. Hold on. There you and go. And just another thing, if you are watching this on YouTube and Facebook, welcome. Please, to see more of this, like and subscribe. Of course, you can join the Zoom we are making it available always on cluewaterbahais.org. We have a special page dedicated for these sessions. Again, all are welcome to join on the Zoom. If you're comfortable with Facebook and YouTube, please again, like this video and subscribe to the channel. That will allow you to get more of this content and also get notified when the content is posted in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Please like and subscribe. So we're going to start today, the first part in 
the chronology called The Guardian, The Life and Work of Shoei Effendi. This is The Guardian, part one, 1897 to 1910, Shoei Effendi's birth, childhood, and adolescence. You see here an absolutely stunning photograph by professional photographer Chad Mauger from his Flickr page. Uh, it is one of the Guardian's beloved garden ornaments. The Guardian loved garden ornaments. We are going to go into very great detail about these in the latter parts of the chronology. It is a stone eagle against a background of clouded skies. And to Shori Effendi, there are so many eagles in the gardens made out of gilded metal and stone because to Shori Effendi, eagles represented victory. I always begin my chronologies with quotes from Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha to set the tone for the entire work. These are the first things that I find before I start a chronology is a tuning fork, a spiritual tuning fork from the Holy Writings. And these two are from the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha, and they speak about Shoghi Effendi's station. Salutation and praise, blessing and glory, rest upon that primal branch of the divine and sacred lote tree, grown out, blessed, tender, verdant, and flourishing from the twin holy trees, the most wondrous and unique and priceless pearl that doth gleam from out the twin surging seas. For behold, he is the blessed and sacred bough that hath branched from the twin holy trees. Well is it with him that seeketh the shelter of his shade that shadoweth all mankind. Abdu'l-Baha, the will and testament of Abdul Baha. I always make a disclaimer at the beginning of every chronology. Only Shori Effendi's words quoted from God passes by. His letters and cables can be considered his own. All other reported utterances of Shori Effendi should be viewed as pilgrim notes. There are 21 parts to this chronology. You can access parts uh, one through 10 with this menu. To access parts 11 through 21, you have to click on this pink button at the bottom right before the thanks and acknowledgements. And that will take you to the next half of the chronology, starting with the marriage of Shoghi Effendi in part 11 and ending with his ascension in part 21. This part, part one, covers the life of Shoghi Effendi from his birth in 1897 to the age of 13 in 1910. March 1st, 1897, the birth of Shoghi Effendi. Many years before 1921, the well-guarded secret. What you see here is a black and white photograph of the house of Abdullah Pasha, where Shoghi Effendi would later be born. Before Shoghi Effendi was born, all Baha'is the world over, especially the Eastern Baha'is and the Persian Baha'is, fully expected Abdul Baha's hereditary successor to be the very next male, eldest male descendant of Baha'u'llah. Many years before Abdul Baha's passing, he received a question from some Persian believers as to whom they should all turn to after his ascension. And Abdul Baha's answer had been, know verily that this is a well-guarded secret. It is even as a gem concealed within its shell. That it will be revealed is predestined. The time will come when its light will appear, when its evidences will be made manifest and its secrets unraveled. Eighteen ninety-seven. The situation in the Holy Land 
the year that Shohi Effendi was born. What's going on here? Give me a second. Let me reload this page. It's an illustrated chronology. You have to see the images. Hmm. Strange. Okay, let me try this. There you go. That should do it. This is a um, sort of reddened, darkened image of the coastline of the holy city of Akka in the Holy Land. Uh, we're going to draw the portrait of what the situation was like for Abdul Baha the year that Shoghi Effendi was born. After the passing of Baha'u'llah in 1892, the Baha'i community was plunged into such a state of grief and consternation as it had never experienced before. The light of divine revelation, which had shone forth from 40 years, was now withdrawn, and the believers tasted the bitter agony of separation from Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha was their only source of consolation as the center of Baha'u'llah's covenant. The forces of darkness reared their head violently only a few hours after Baha'u'llah had passed away, when Mirza Muhammad Ali, Abdul Baha's half brother, same father, different mother, stole from Abdul Baha the two cases containing Baha'u'llah's writing materials, seals, and papers, which he had bequeathed the day or a few days before to Abdul Baha, his eldest son, who was to be the center of the covenant. On the fourth night after Baha'u'llah's ascension around midnight, a disconsolate Abdul Baha watched as his duplicitous half brothers violated his father's cases, rifling through the papers. Covenant breaking disrupted the life of the Baha'is in the Holy Land with constant attacks on Abdul Baha for four years after the ascension of Baha'u'llah. Mirza Muhammad Ali ran a campaign to discredit Abdul Baha in the eyes of the Baha'is by poisoning their minds. The covenant breakers invented fake stories about Abdul Baha and disseminated them among influential people of Akka, including a lie about how Abdul Baha had cut off their livelihood. Mirza Muhammad Ali sent his sons dressed in rags to the homes of important people begging for food, refused Abdul Baha's shipments of wheat, and sent petitions complaining Abdul Baha never gave him his share of wheat from the Jordan Valley fields, even though he just refused the shipments. All these campaigns, lies, calumnies, petitions, and official complaints were destined to discredit and humiliate Abdul Baha in a multitude of devious and deeply cruel ways. Around 1897, when Shohi Effendi was born, the situation was dire, and it was time, and it was a time of profound tension and unrest. Enemies were everywhere plotting. March 1st, 1897, Shoghi Effendi is born. This is the upper room in the southwest corner of the house of Abdullah Pasha, where Shoghi Effendi was born in Akka on the 1st of March, 1897. Shoghi Effendi was born on the first day of the month of fasting, March 1st, 1897, in an upper room in the south wing of the house of Abdullah Pasha in Akka. He was Abdul Baha's eldest grandson, the son of Mirza Hadi Shirazi and Ziaye Hanum, Abdul Baha and Munir Hanum's eldest daughter. His name, Shoghi, means one who longs. He was the priceless pearl that doth gleam from out the twin surging seas, the twin descendant of a family of the Bab on his father's side and of the family of Baha'u'llah on his mother's side. Shoghi Effendi was born a prisoner. At the time of his birth, Abdul Baha and Abdul Baha's entire family were still prisoners of the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid. Shoghi Effendi was designated 
the Ghusni Mumtaz, the chosen branch, and was descended from the families of two manifestations of God. Baha'u'llah on his mother Ziai Hanum's side, and the Bab on his father Hadimirza Shirazi Afnan on his father's side. Excuse me for one second. This is why mm -hmm. in his will and testament, Abdul Baha, sorry, Abdul Baha emphasized his double divine heritage three times in the will and testament, speaking about first the twin surging seas, the twin holy trees, and third time speaking about the fruit of the two offshoots of the tree of holiness calling Shoghi Effendi the most wondrous, unique, and priceless pearl, calling Shoghi Effendi a blessed and sacred bough, calling Shoghi Effendi the youthful branched, branched from the two hallowed and sacred low trees. Shoghi Effendi was of the most distinguished and royal lineage. On the side of Baha'u'llah, he was a descendant of two manifestations of God, Zoroaster and Abraham. And he was, <laughs> ah, the dimidistre. Comment? Comment? <laughs> Sorry. Apologies. Um, Shogi Effendi was of the most distinguished and royal lineage. On the side of Baha'u'llah, he was a descendant of two manifestations of God, Zoroaster and Abraham. And he was of royal Persian blood as well, a descendant of the Sasanian kings of Persia, an ancient dynasty. On the side of the Bab's family, Shoghi Effendi was born a Sayyid, a direct descendant of the third manifestation of God, the prophet Muhammad himself. So in his genetic mix, he comes from an ancient Persian royal family, the Sasanians. And in his, in his genetic mix, he also has direct descendants from three manifestations of God, from the prophet Muhammad, Zoroaster, and Abraham. Of course, Shoghi Effendi is not directly descended from the Bab because the Bab only had one child who died shortly after childbirth. But he does share with the Bab um, uh, the same great-grandfather. So it was the Bab's grandfather and Shoghi Effendi's great, great, great grandfather. So that's how he is descended from the family of the Bab. And that's how he is descended from the family of Muhammad. I think that's very important to dwell on that, to understand really how special the guardian was. I'm going to talk about the station of the guardian now. Um, the image I chose for this is, you will see many of these images throughout the chronology the snow-capped peaks in the Swiss Alps, which the guardian climbed as a mountain climber with ropes and all those gears until he was in his mid-30s. But he returned to Switzerland until the a month before he passed away. His love for Switzerland is one of the major themes that runs through this chronology. And I wanted to honor that lifelong love with beautiful image um, to speak about this. I think that at this moment in the chronology, uh, when Shoghi Effendi has just been born, this is the only thing that's happened so far in his life. I think it's very important that we understand or try to understand or try to commune together and meditate on uh, his unique station in the faith. Um, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, the Bab, and Abdul Baha were the three central figures of the Baha'i faith. The Bab and Baha'u'llah were manifestations of God, the twin manifestations of the Baha'i dispensation. The Bab was, as Shoghi Effendi explained, the founder of the Babi dispensation, a self-sufficient manifestation of God, invested with sovereign power and authority, I'm quoting now from one of uh, Shoghi Effendi's letters, invested with sovereign power and authority, and exercises all the rights and prerogatives of independent prophethood. Inspired precursor 
of the Baha'i revelation, subordinate in rank to Baha'u'llah. On the other hand, Shoghi Effendi describes Baha'u'llah as, quote, transcendental in his majesty, serene, awe-inspiring, unapproachably glorious, ushering a revelation of incomparable greatness and the culmination of a cycle, the final stage in a series of successive, of preliminary and progressive revelations. Abdu'l-Baha was not a manifestation of God. He fulfilled, as Shoghi Effendi stated, not only a unique function, but also moved, quote, in a sphere of his own and holding a rank radically different than that of the author and the forerunner of the Baha'i revelation. And the guardian, the appointed interpreter of the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the chief builder and engineer of the Baha'i world order moved in a very distinct sphere of his own different than that of the twin manifestations of God and different than that of the perfect exemplar in the center of the covenant. Shoghi Effendi is not one of the three central figures of the Baha'i faith. And as such, it was not exactly clear to Baha'is what his station was exactly. So Shoghi Effendi clarified it in a letter dated 8 February, 1934. And this now is a quote from Shoghi Effendi's letter. No guardian, and this is one of the only things he ever said about his guardianship. No guardian of the faith, I feel it my solemn duty to place on record, can ever claim to be the perfect exemplar of the teachings of Baha'u'llah or the stainless mirror that reflects his light. Though overshadowed by the unfailing, the unerring protection of Baha'u'llah and of the Bab, and however much he may share with Abdul Baha the right and obligation to interpret Baha'i teachings, he remains essentially human and cannot, if he wishes to remain faithful to his trust, arrogate to himself under any pretense whatsoever the rights, the privileges, and prerogatives which Baha'u'llah has chosen to confer upon his son, Abdul Baha. In the light of this truth, to pray to the guardian of the faith, to address him as Lord and Master, to designate him as his holiness, to seek his benediction, to celebrate his birthday, or to commemorate any event associated with his life would be tantamount to a departure from those established truths that are enshrined within our beloved faith. The fact that the guardian has been specifically endowed with such power as he may need to reveal the purport and disclose the implications of the utterances of Baha'u'llah and of Abdul Baha does not necessarily confer upon him a station co-equal with those whose words he is called to interpret. He can exercise that right and discharge this obligation and yet remain infinitely inferior to them in rank and different in nature. To the integrity of this cardinal principle of our faith, the words, the deeds of its present and future guardians must abundantly testify. By their conduct and example, they must needs establish its truth upon an unassailable foundation and transmit to future generations unimpeachable evidences of its reality. For my own part, to hesitate in recognizing so vital a truth or to vacillate in proclaiming so firm a conviction must constitute a shameless betrayal of the confidence reposed in me by Abdul Baha and an unpardonable usurpation of the authority which he himself hath been invested. Eighteen ninety seven to eighteen ninety eight, Shoghi Effendi's infancy. I begin with a series of vignettes that you're going to see throughout this chronology, honoring my most important and valuable sources, the sources around which I have built the architecture of this chronology. And in fact, 
um, this whole chronology takes its cue from the administrative order descriptions from God Passes By and from the Priceless Pearl. Every single thing. If there is an event that is described by two different people, I've always chosen the way that Ruhia Hanum described it in the Priceless Pearl. I have never found a single date to be wrong in the Priceless Pearl. She is on, this is the perfect biography of Shoghi Effendi. And I want to share why this biography is so important. Uh, before we begin our journey really into the infancy of, of, of Shoghi Effendi and his life, um, I want to pay tribute to the Priceless Pearl by Hand of the Cause, Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanum, who was married to Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of Baha'i faith, for 20 years. The Priceless Pearl takes its title from this quote that we've now said a couple of times from the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha. It's how he describes Shoghi Effendi, and that's the title of this biography written by his by his wife. Um Ruhiya Hanum is so clear-sighted and such a phenomenal writer. Her, her style is so eloquent. Uh, but throughout this biography, the most um, stunning criteria is her respect for the guardian. He will, Shoghi Effendi was always her guardian before anything else. And, and this is why... For the long months that I was writing the chronology, this was my 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 number one source. Um, it is by far the best Baha'i biography ever written on any Baha'i. It is astonishingly well written. Um, Ruhiya Hanum was born with the gift of words, both written and spoken. For 12 years when she was serving the faith between the ages of 15 and 27, the Guardian specifically encouraged her to practice and develop not only her writing but public speaking skills. Um, while addressing every part of the Guardian's life in The Priceless Pearl, Ruhiya Hanum felt inclined to share few things from his personal life, mostly in his infancy and childhood. And then less and less of Shoghi Effendi's personal life as he got older, except in one chapter where she shares her diary entries, which are quite intimate. Um, but one of the other reasons why The Price is Pearl is the best Baha'i biography ever written, because every page, every chapter, every word is suffused and infused with Ruhiya Hanum's adoring love for the guardian and you're not going to find this in any other book than in the book of the woman who shared 20 years of her life with Shoghi Effendi. Um, it's very interesting to note however that there is absolutely no information regarding her marriage to Shoghi Effendi in the Priceless Pearl. The wedding yes, nothing after that and there are no published photographs of Ruhi Hanum standing with Shoghi Effendi. Abdul Baha's eldest grandson. This is a photo from the Priceless Pearl. It's the frontispiece of the Priceless Pearl. Abdul Baha and Munir Hanum had, oh my God, just look at those beautiful eyes. Beautiful eyes. Abdul Baha and Munir Hanum had eight children four of whom died in infancy or childhood, two boys and two girls died, Mirza Mehdi, who bore the same name as Abdul Baha's deceased younger brother, martyred younger brother, Ruhangis, Fuadiye, and Hussein Effendi. By the time Shoghi Effendi was born, Abdul Baha was 53 years old. Shoghi Effendi was Abdul Baha's eldest grandson, the child of Abdul Baha's first eldest surviving daughter, Ziaye Hanum. Although Abdul Baha would go on to have 12 other grandchildren from three of his four surviving daughters, one of them never had children, Shoghi Effendi alone would inherit what Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanum called the nobility of his grandfather Abdul Baha. The depths of Abdul Baha's feelings at the time of Shoghi Effendi's birth are reflected in his own words, in which he clearly states the name Shoghi, one who longs, was conferred by God upon his grandson. O oh God, this is a branch sprung from the tree of thy mercy. 
Through thy grace and bounty, enable him to grow, and through the showers of thy generosity, cause him to become a verdant, flourishing, blossoming, and fruitful branch. Gladden the eyes of his parents, thou who giveth to whomsoever thou willeth, and bestow upon him the name Shohi, so that he may yearn for thy kingdom and soar into the realms of the unseen. From the moment Shohi Effendi was born, he would wrap himself tightly around Abdul Baha's heart, and he moved from childhood to adolescence and to adulthood, the in inextricably close link between grandfather and grandson, that spiritual mysterious bond would grow deeper and deeper and more and more powerful. Around July 1897, an astonishing four month old baby Shogi Effendi. This is a photograph of an amazing Baha'i, Dr. Yunis Khan Afrukte, who wrote this luminous book, his memoirs, Nine Years, memoir, Memories of Nine Years in Akka, his memoirs of serving Abdul Baha for nine years. He had very little information about Shogi Effendi in that book, except for whatever you're going to hear in the following pages. This is one story, and it's amazing. For months after Shoghi Effendi was born, everyone in the Holy Land, pilgrims and Baha'i residents, wanted to meet Abdul Baha's eldest grandson, a direct descendant of Baha'u'llah. Everyone expressed great interest, and they constantly pleaded with Shoghi Effendi's father, Mirza, Hadi Shirazi asking, can we see the baby? We want to see the baby. At the time, Dr. Yunus Khan Afrukte was on his first pilgrimage. He wasn't serving for nine years at the time. He was on his first pilgrimage before that long period of time that makes up the bulk of his memoirs. He was about, uh, he was there for about five months. Um, then he would return three years later, and then he would stay for nine years in Akka and write his thrilling memoirs. So one day, around July 1897, when Shoghi Effendi was around four months old, Shoghi Effendi, the baby, was brought to the reception room of the house of Abdul Baha, and the friends were beside themselves with joy. Finally, they got to see the baby. Everyone rushed to look at the infant, including this man, Dr. Yunis Khan Afrukte, much younger though, probably. Dr. Afrukte tried his very, very best to consciously look at Abdul Baha's baby grandson, the great grandson of Baha'u'llah's supreme manifestation of God, as if it were just another Baha'i baby. But then he had a very profound and very unexpected spiritual experience. Although Shori Effendi was only four months old, and Dr. Afrukte was at the time in his 30s, he found himself utterly compelled to deeply bow in deep respect to the infant as soon as he arrived before him. For about a minute, Dr. Afrukte was completely captivated by the beauty of Shoghi Effendi and his face. He kissed the soft hair on his blessed head, and as he kissed him, he felt an indescribable quality in Shoghi Effendi. Dr. Afrute could not stop thinking how much Shoghi Effendi looked like the traditional depictions of the infant Jesus. And for several days after meeting Shoghi Effendi, he could clearly see his shining face in front of his eyes. Gradually, the clear image of Shoghi Effendi's face faded, but Dr. Afrute would never, ever forget the powerful first impression and the deep spiritual experience of meeting Shoghi Effendi for the first time. Shortly after March 1st, 1897, a little child shall lead them. This is an oil painting not meant to represent Shoghi Effendi. It is meant to illustrate the Bible verse, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, titled, A Little Child Shall Lead Them, which is the subject of this story. By the early spring of 1897, news had traveled to the West that a grandson had been born 
to Abdul Baha. And an American Baha'i had written to the master, quoting the Bible verse of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, and the faulting together, and the little child shall lead them. The woman asked Abdul Baha if this verse intended a real live child who existed. This was Abdul Baha's response. O oh, maidservant of God, verily that child is born and is alive, and from him will appear wondrous things that thou wilt hear of in the future. Thou shalt behold him endowed with the most perfect appearance, supreme capacity, absolute perfection, consummate power, and unsurpassed might. His face will shine with a radiance that illumines all horizons of the world. Therefore, forget this not as long as thou dost live, inasmuch as ages and centuries were, will bear traces of him. Upon thee be greetings and praise, Abdul Baha Abbas. Incidentally, Abdu'l-Bahá's birth name, Abbas, means lion. Sometime after Shoghi Effendi's birth, one has recently been born. This is, of course, the same image we saw earlier. With a close-up of his hand. Because one of the words in the quote says, the triumph of, God, of the cause is in his hands. One day, shortly after Shoghi Effendi was born, Dr. Afrukte and Abdul Baha were walking together past the Khan Avamid, the Inn of the Pillars, the caravanserai which housed the very first Baha'i pilgrim house in Akka. So this is in 1897. Dr. Afrukte was very, very uncomfortable. He received the mail and it was his job to tell Abdul Baha what was in the mail and he was uncomfortable about one of the letters that had arrived. What made Dr. Afrute so uncomfortable was that this was an American believer, so more direct than Eastern believers. And this American believer had addressed the issue of the death of Abdul Baha in, in a way that was so direct it made the Dr. Afrute quite uncomfortable to bring up to a living Abdul Baha who was walking right next to him. It was something that would have been unthinkable for a Persian believer to write to the master, um, to talk about and to ask about and to ask details about. Just a, a Persian would not have done that in 1897. But the Americans were very, very uh, upfront. And this is a quality that Abdul Baha very much loved about them. So Dr. Afrute uh, would learn many years later that the question from the American believer was actually directed to the previous story in which Abdul Baha was asked about the Bible verse, a little child shall lead them, whether it concerned Shoghi Effendi. So it was connected to that same letter that he wrote to an American believer, which prompted another American believer to write another letter. And so the letters were connected in that way. Dr. Afrukte summoned up his courage and very diplomatically approached Abdul Baha and told him, uh, someone has written to me from America that we have heard the master has said, the one whose appearance will follow me has recently been born and is in this world. If this is so, we are answered. But if this is not so then, Abdul Baha paused for a moment. Then with a look full of meaning and secret exaltation, he said, yes, this is true. Hearing this definite and reassuring answer from Abdul Baha, Dr. Afrukte's soul was filled with joy. Finally, a proof that all that covenant breaking that they were suffering would amount to nothing. And the faith of Baha'u'llah would triumph. But he still had a question, particularly about the word appearance in the American believer's letter. So he asked Abdul Baha, this word appearance, does it mean a revelation? Abdu'l-Baha 
did not answer his direct question with a yes or a no. Instead, he put an end to that line of inquiry by stating very clearly, the triumph of God is of the cause of God is in his hands. Dr. Afrukte followed Abdul Baha's lead in responding to the letter, but didn't allow himself to wonder whether this child was born and whether he was in Karbila or somewhere else in the world. Five years later, however, he received the answer to his silent question when he clearly observed Shoghi Effendi's wondrous moral virtues and evident marks of greatness, even in his early childhood. This is a very short story, very, very short story. Sometime after August 1895, when Shoghi Effendi was five months old, it's about Shoghi Effendi dreaming. This is Abdul Baha's bedroom in the house of Abdullah Pasha. One night, while Shoghi Effendi was still an infant, he woke up crying, and his loving grandfather, Abdul Baha, asked his nurse to bring Shoghi Effendi to him so that he could comfort him. And Abdul Baha said to his sister, the greatest holy leaf, See, he already has dreams. Eighteen ninety eight to nineteen o four, Shoghi Effendi's early childhood. March eighteen ninety nine, Ella Goodall Cooper witnesses the spiritual bond between Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi. This is a beautiful photograph, beautiful quality of photograph from uh, actually. I should say this because this is going to happen over and over in the chronology. Um, there are so many things that are not possible to illustrate, um, such as this story of a connection between Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi, because I had limited numbers of Abdul Baha's pictures and limited numbers of Shoghi Effendi's pictures, and I couldn't keep using the same pictures. So I tried to illustrate many uh, vignettes in the chronology with photographs that have a common aspect or common quality with the story I'm telling. And this story is about the bond of Abdul Baha with a Shoghi Effendi who is a toddler. And so this is a photograph of Abdul Baha tenderly holding a toddler. Um, this is a photograph dated 24th of April, 1912 of, of Abdul Baha seated with the Khan children, uh, the children of Ali Kuli Khan and Florence Khan in their Washington DC home. Um, Marzi Gale, Hamide and Rahim, their three children. When Shoghi Effendi was a little less than two years old, the very first Western pilgrims arrived in Akka and at the house of Abdullah Pasha to meet Abdul Baha, led by Phoebe Hurst and including Robert Turner, Anne Apperson, Julia Pearson, Lua Getzinger, Ella Goodall Cooper. Around March 1899, Ella Goodall, was with the ladies of the Holy Family in the room of the greatest Holy Leaf for morning tea in the presence of Abdul Baha, who was sitting in his favorite corner of the divan where he could look out onto the blue Mediterranean through the window on his right. Abdul Baha was occupied with revealing tablets and the room was quiet. With just the sound of the bubbling samovar and the soft sounds of a young woman brewing tea, Abdul Baha looked up and asked Shoghi Effendi's mother, Zia Yahanum, to chant a prayer. When she finished, the two-year-old Shoghi Effendi appeared in the doorway, immediately opposite his grandfather, and Ella Goodall takes up the story. I'm going to drink something first. After having dropped off his shoes, he stepped into the room with his eyes focused on the master's face. Abdul Baha returned his gaze with a look of loving welcome. It seemed to beckon to the small one to approach him. Shoghi, that beautiful little boy with his cameo face and his soulful, appealing dark eyes, walked slowly towards the divan. 
the master drawing him by an invisible thread until he stood quite close in front of him. As he paused there for a moment, Abdu'l-Bahá did not offer to embrace him, but sat perfectly still, only nodding his head two or three times, slowly and impressively, as if to say, you see, this tie connecting us is not just that of a physical grandfather, but something far deeper and more significant. While we breathlessly watched to see what he would do, the little boy reached down, picking up the hem of Abdul Baha's robe. He touched it reverently to his forehead, kissed it, then gently replaced it while never taking his eyes off of his grandfather. The next moment he turned away and scampered off to play like any normal child. At that time, he was Abdul Baha's only grandchild, and naturally, he was of immense interest to the pilgrims. You know, this story of Abdul Baha and Shori Effendi is a story of all consuming love on the part of Shogi Effendi, of course. Abdul Baha could not show preference to him in order to keep him safe. No one could know who Shogi Effendi was. But Shogi Effendi was a child. He could not restrain his affection. As an adult, Shogi Effendi would often speak to his wife, Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanum, about his childhood with Abdul Baha. And she understood through the words of Shoghi Effendi himself, the constraints of that love between the master and the guardian, Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi, grandfather and grandson. They both struggled with the love for each other that was bound by external circumstances. Abdul Baha could not give free reign to his affection, his love, his preference for Shohi Effendi. He could not express visibly the intensity of his love for him because to show the depth and breadth of such a powerful love and to make visible such a strong spiritual connection would endanger Shohi Effendi's life. Abdul Baha's many enemies hovering around at that dangerous time in his life would have loved to discover such a weakness in Abdul Baha as an infant or a toddler or a child that was destined to be his successor. They would have loved to hurt him by hurting that child. Even as a young child, Shoghi Effendi had been aware of this. He knew that his grandfather had to leash his love for him in order to protect and safeguard him. And in protecting and safeguarding Shoghi Effendi, Abdul Baha was protecting and safeguarding the covenant. Thirty October nineteen hundred. This is a photograph of Shoghi Effendi sitting on the knee of Western pilgrims in nineteen o one. So around the age of three slash four. Um, so standing left to right, Charles Mason Remy, Sigurd Russell, Edward Getzinger, Laura Clifford Barney, seated left to right, Ethel Jenner Rosenberg, Madame Jackson, Shogi Effendi, Helen Ellis Cole, Lua Getzinger, and Imogene Hogue. Thirty October nineteen hundred. I love you very much. On thirty October nineteen hundred, Charlotte, Louise, and Eleanor Dixon arrived on pilgrimage from Washington D.C. and were taken to the house of Abdul Baha in Haifa. This time, where they were taken, where they were welcomed by Lua Getzinger and Harriet Thornborough. The Dixon family was introduced to Bahie Hanum, the greatest holy leaf the sister of Abdul Baha and daughter of Baha'u'llah, and a three-and-a-half-year-old Shoghi Effendi sitting in the lap of the greatest holy leaf. 
Shogi Effendi greeted the pilgrims with the only words of English he spoke at the age of three and a half, which were, I love you very much. Then the three and a half year old Shogi Effendi chanted a prayer for them. 1902, this is a very, very famous story. You must all know this story. I'm going to tell it anyway. 1902, Shoghi Effendi's first tablet from Abdul Baha. This is an absolutely beautiful picture of the inner courtyard of the house of Abdullah Pasha where this story takes place. This is from the site, luminous spot. If you do not know this site, go to the site. It's the photography of Farzam Sabetian, who is an amazing photographer. When Shoghi Effendi was only five years old, he would insist that Abdul Baha write something for him. Do you see the love of words already still in the young, young child? Already a love of words. So the master revealed a very touching letter for his grandson, Shoghi Effendi's first tablet from Abdul Baha at the age of five. This is the tablet. He is God. Oh, my Shori, I have no time to talk. Leave me alone. You said, write. I have written. What else should be done? Now is not the time for you to read and write. It is the time for jumping about and chanting, oh, my God. Therefore, memorize the prayers of the Blessed Beauty and chant them that I may hear them, because there is no time for anything else. When Shoghi Effendi received this wonderful gift, he immediately began memorizing a number of Baha'u'llah's prayers and would chant them so loudly that the entire neighborhood could hear him. But of course, Abdul Baha had said, chant them that I may hear them. So he was just obeying. Shoghi Effendi's parents and other members of the family tried to get him to stop and scolded him to no avail. Shoghi Effendi replied, the master wrote to me to chant that he may hear me. I am doing my best. Shoghi Effendi, perseverant and hardworking as a child, as he would be as our beloved guardian, kept on chanting at the top of his voice for many hours every day. <laughs> In the end, his parents went to Abdul Baha and begged him to stop the child, but Abdul Baha told his parents to leave Shoghi Effendi alone. Shoghi Effendi's interest in science. Now, this very handsome fellow here is Dr. Zia Baghdadi, the young medical student that we're going to hear about in the story below, who is already going to be very impressed with Shoghi Effendi. So in 1902, 1903, when Shoghi Effendi was five or six, he and his mother traveled to Beirut, Lebanon, not too far from Akka, just a few hundred miles or kilometers along the Mediterranean coast. And Shoghi Effendi made a lifelong friend in Zia Baghdadi, who was older than he was, quite a bit older than he was. One year later, one year after their visit, so one year after 1902-1903, so this would be 1903-1904, Dr. Zia Baghdadi now came to visit Abdul Baha in the Holy Land, and Shoghi Effendi, accompanied by his parents, and the greatest holy leaf and other members of the holy family came to welcome the young doctor. This is him, I assume, in his medical uh, graduation gown from Beirut. Shoghi Effendi spent most of his time in Dr. Baghdadi's room, looking at pictures in his medical books and asking questions. But soon, the young child was asking to see a live dissection, not just pictures. Dr. Baghdadi obliged. He got a servant to shoot a large wildcat. And he began dissecting the animal in front of Shoghi Effendi, one of his aunts, and the servant who had killed the animal, and explaining 
what he was doing as he was doing it. And Shohi Effendi watched the dissection in absorbed silence. When he had finished dissecting, Dr. Baghdadi asked himself, how much could such a young, young child have understood of the complex procedure? But he was absolutely astonished to hear Shohi Effendi repeat word for word the main points that he had made during the dissection. Dr. Baghdadi would later state, I said to myself, no, 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 no. This is not an ordinary child. Verily, this is a precious and darling angel. Twelve years later, one of Shoghi Effendi's first subjects as a student at the University of Beirut, which was called Syrian Protestant College, would be zoology. A seed was planted early. 21 April 1904, to 1905, Shoghi Effendi during Laura Dreyfus Barney's pilgrimage. This is a photograph of a young Shoghi Effendi with a dark fez on his head, holding the greatest name, and one of his sisters. On the 21st of April, 1904, Laura Barney and Ethel Rosenberg arrived in Akka for a one-year pilgrimage during which Laura began one, her masterpiece, Some Answered Questions, in which Abdul Baha gave her his tired moments to answer timeless spiritual questions, many of them relating to the Bible. This was Laura Barney's third pilgrimage, and she would return to the Holy Land several more times. This was a dangerous time for Abdul Baha as the commission of inquiry would arrive from Istanbul to question him during Laura Barney's pilgrimage. At the time, Shoghi Effendi was seven or eight years old, rather small for his age, but very keen and very attentive. After his early morning studies, Shoghi Effendi would follow Abdul Baha like his shadow and spent long hours sitting on the Persian rug, silently listening to every word his adored grandfather was saying. Shoghi Effendi had a truly remarkable memory. And at times in the presence of pilgrims, Abdul Baha would ask his favorite grandson, the apple of his eye, to recite passages from Baha'u'llah's writings or chant prayers that he had memorized. Laura Barney was very moved by Shoghi Effendi's limpid, crystalline chanting. And it was obvious to her that Shoghi Effendi's entire being and soul were engaged in communion with God during those precious moments. Shoghi Effendi's eagerness, a quality he retained until the day he died. Eagerness animated him like a burning fire in everything that he did. Shoghi Effendi as a child, part one. Shoghi Effendi's boundless energy. I thought this picture represented energy quite well, don't you? <laughs> it's very sweet. It's Shoghi Effendi as a young child, smiling as he's held aloft by two Baha'i men. It's from Priceless Pearl. In Amatul Baha Ruhiya Hanum's words, Shoghi Effendi was a small, sensitive, intensely active, and mischievous child. Hand of the cause, Ruhiya Hanum's words, I did not call the guardian mischievous, she did. Later, Shoghi Effendi himself would say that in childhood, he had been the acknowledged ringleader of all the other children. Shoghi Effendi was bubbling with joy, enthusiasm, and daring. He was full of laughter and wit, and he was the mastermind of many pranks. <laughs> Filled with boundless energy, Shoghi Effendi often raced up and down the long flight of stairs in the upper story of the house of Abdullah Pasha to the consternation of the pilgrims below, anxiously waiting to meet Abdullah. Shoghi Effendi's inexpressible exuberance, irrepressible exuberance, was the source of the adult Shoghi Effendi's tireless and unflinching reserves of energy beyond human comprehension that would lead him in decades to come to victory after victory in building the administrative order of the Baha'i faith and safeguarding the faith of Baha'u'llah. Abdu'l-Baha himself was a witness to Shoghi Effendi's tireless energy. One day, 
he wrote a little sentence on the back of a used envelope, just a few lines to please Shogi Effendi. He wrote, Shogi Effendi is a wise man, but he runs about very much. Shogi Effendi's physical traits. I will not often describe Shogi Effendi physically. This is one of the only places in the chronology where I do. I may do so one or two other times. But I chose this photograph. Actually, this is quite a large photograph. You can see him all the way down to his cute little leather shoes and his little three-button pants and his little coat. It's very, very cute. But I'm just going to focus on the beautiful face here. I want to describe his physical features for you. It's not a very long, um, not a very long story. Um, Shogi Effendi was not born extremely robust, extremely strong, but he was he was fine he was fine boned, which you can see in his in his photographs. He has a very fine featured face, um, and at first his mother Zia Yehanum worried a lot about his health, but he would soon grow to have a strong iron constitution and a will strong willpower and a phenomenally strong force of nature. As a young child, you can see here very, very clearly, he had a heart-shaped face with immense, very intense hazel-colored eyes with sometimes changed color to a warm gray. His face was deeply, deeply expressive. Shoghi Effendi would be shorter than Abdu'l-Baha and more closely physically resembled his great-grandfather, Baha'u'llah. He looked more like Baha'u'llah than he did Abdu'l-Baha. Shoghi Effendi's courteous nature and spiritual sensitivities. Sometimes when the illustrations are not obvious, I'm going to explain them a little bit. Shoghi, this is a, uh, this is a very, very exquisite uh, example of Sasanian art, the uh, royal dynasty from which Shoghi Effendi is descended. It's a detail of Sasanian metalwork depicting the head of a king from the fourth century. It's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the reason I chose this, because this is really kind of impossible to illustrate a story about a courteous nature. So I thought he's descended from this ancient royal family and I used that as my illustration, the nobility of a true royal family and all its best assets. Of course, even though, as Ria Hanum said, Shoghi Effendi was mischievous, he was also impeccably raised. He had been taught courtesy and manners from the cradle. And it would distinguish him his whole life. His politeness and courtesy was one of his most distinguishing characteristics, along with his eagerness. And after all, Baha'u'llah's family was of exceedingly noble stock, descended from Zoroaster and the Sasanian kings of Persia on Baha'u'llah's side, and on Asiye Hanum's side, descended from Abraham. Asiye Hanum was the mother of Abu Baha, the greatest holy leaf, and Mirza Mehdi. The Holy Family's tradition, above and beyond the teachings of the faith, considered courtesy obligatory and ensured that Shoghi Effendi was distinguished with noble conduct and extreme politeness from his babyhood. Nowhere was Shoghi Effendi's courtesy and perfect conduct more obvious than in his worshipful attitude to his beloved grandfather. Shoghi Effendi also had a deeply tender and very sweet nature. If it ever happened that he had somehow offended a playmate. And this would only happen unless the child had cheated or schemed. Shoghi Effendi could not go to sleep that night before he had made his friend happy and they had embraced. Even as a child, he encouraged his friends to make up their differences before going to bed. Shoghi Effendi also had a deeply spiritual nature and was prone to vivid and meaningful dreams, sometimes pleasant, but also at times unpleasant. This is a different type of vignette. I want to take you into the life of the Holy Family, into their home, into the Holy Family's breakfast. This is Abdul Baha's room in Haifa at Seven Haparsim.
We're in the technical difficulties here. So while while we are uh, in the process of resolving that, um, we have right now. Did you see me? A, yes, we do. We do. Okay. Just a quick can thing I, for those of you who joined in. Uh, please go and uh, visit the YouTube channel to, again, subscribe to this so you can see more of these videos. Thanks. Okay, so I before uh, the electricity went off and they took too long to turn the generator back on, so I was deprived of internet for a few seconds. That's why I disappeared. I am now back. Hopefully we won't have another power cut, but I can't promise anything because this is Congo after all. I said that I was going to take you into the Holy Family's breakfast. So in Shogi Effendi's childhood, the Holy Family had the habit of rising at dawn and spending the first hour of the day in Abdul Baha's room. This room. Shogi Effendi had once been late for morning prayers and he was never late ever again. From that moment on, he was the first one to get up and arrive at the master's room. In the morning, the children sat on the floor, their legs folded to... And the family and the children would chant prayers and eat breakfast with Abdul Baha. Amatul Baha Ruhiya Khanum describes the Holy Family's morning meal. Breakfast consisted of tea brewed on the bubbling Russian brass samovar and served in little crystal glasses, very hot and very sweet, pure wheat bread and goat's milk cheese. So, 1897 to 1905, Shori Effendi's childhood suffering. This section covers the same time frame as we've covered so far in these pleasant, lovely stories, but I'm going to talk to you about unpleasant things, the suffering of Abdul Baha and the suffering of Shori Effendi, because it's very important to understand that is a a building block of, of of our guardian, our beloved guardian. He wasn't just running about, chanting prayers, having breakfast, listening to his... He also experienced deep, deep suffering at several times in his formative years, up until the age of 15, and then, of course, at the age of 21, when his grandfather suddenly passed away. So we have to really... This is very, very important. And this is a stunning, colorized, not color photograph, colorized photograph of Abdul Baha from... Um, the Baha'i International Community at Baha'i Media Bank, a beautiful website. From the moment of his birth, um, just want to do this so you can see his hands as well. From the moment of his birth, Shoghi Effendi was surrounded by his grandfather, Abdul Baha's suffering. In 1897, when he was born, covenant breaking was at its peak since the ascension of Baha'u'llah. Although it had started just hours after Baha'u'llah passed away, in May of 1892, when Mirza Muhammad Ali stole the two cases of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha's own inheritance. Shoghi Effendi was an infant when it started, and he was eight years old when the climax of all this suffering, the commission of inquiry from Istanbul, took place. It's very important as we begin this very intense dive into the Guardian's entire life to understand that he was inured to suffering from the moment he was born, and to understand why he was named, to understand why being named guardian of the cause by Abdul Baha sent him into such a shock. All of these things play into each other. Shoghi Effendi knew exactly what being the head of the Baha'i faith entailed because he spent an entire childhood, up on the, until the age of 21, he spent 21 years watching Abdul Baha being the head of the faith. So he knew exactly, exactly, exactly what being the world head of the Baha'i faith entailed. Of course, the master was the center of the covenant. He was the guardian, but they were still at the head of the faith. He saw Abdul Baha endure like a living martyr through the nightmare of covenant breaking during his, his own ministry. This chronology is focused on Shoghi Effendi, who had no role in any of these events. 
But because these events happened while he was a child and they had an enormous impact on him, I still want to cover them, even though they strictly don't don't uh, feature uh, Shoghi Effendi. And that's my rule usually for stories in this chronology. I want to make a little exception for this because I think it's extremely important. It will provide a balanced understanding of what Ab Shoghi Effendi's childhood must have been like, especially since he was such a sensitive, perceptive, uh, intuitive young boy. Um, living with Abdul Baha day in, day out, following him like his shadow, while all these forces of evil attacked his grandfather day and night. So first off, first unpleasant pill to swallow, 1897-1900, the be abject betrayal of Mirza Akhajan. So all the, from now on, every single illustration for any kind of covenant breaking or martyrdom will be red on black in this sort of format, sort of abstract illustration. In 1897, the year Shoghi Effendi was born, Mirza Arajan, Baha'u'llah's amanuensis for 40 years, committed to the covenant breakers and plotted secretly with them on ways to destabilize the Baha'i community and cause the greatest possible amount of discord and division. Mirza Arajan lied about receiving revelation from God, lied about having received a tablet from heaven, which he wrote himself in green ink, which he had used to take down Baha'u'llah's revelation uh, he used it in the same handwriting that he had used. I mean, it's so sick. He wrote in the same handwriting that he had used for 40 years to take down real revelation from Baha'u'llah. He wrote down fake revelation and said that he had received revelation. From 1897 to 1900, when he died, uh, or the year before he died, Mirza Akhajan lived inside the holiest shrine of Baha'u'llah, the holiest place for Baha'is in the world. For, for three years, he lived inside the shrine. A covenant breaker lived inside the shrine. For three years, Abdul Baha and the Baha'is had to pray outside of the holiest place on earth because Mirza Akhajan was inside. When the Baha'is gathered, Mirza Akhajan would come out bareheaded, barefoot, and wrapped in a shroud and mumble nonsense, stress, staggering around the Baha'is while they were praying. 1900, so Shoghi Effendi would have been three years old, attempts on the life of Abdul Baha. By 1900, Mirza Akhajan died and the covenant breakers had disrupted the local Baha'i community's life. They had occupied the mansion of Bahji, which would not return to the faith for almost 30 years. They spread blatant lies about the shrine of the Bab that Abdul Baha was at the time building in Haifa during the childhood of Shoghi Effendi, that was the major, major building work in Haifa was the Shrine of the Bab. And this started uh, a year or two after Shoghi Effendi was born. So Shoghi Effendi would have been very aware of the building of the shrine. Um, and so they lied to the author Ottoman authorities saying that Abdul Baha was raising an army and preparing to attack the Ottoman forces because where Abdul Baha was living in Akka and Haifa, uh, this was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was very large at the time. This was shortly before the end of the Ottoman Empire, which is happening in five years time from now. This is all going to come to a boil soon. There were attempts to murder Abdul Baha on two separate occasions one by poisoning a jug of water and one with a dagger. The indictment of Abdul Baha, 1904. This is Sultan Abdul Hamid II of the Ottoman Empire, an enemy of Abdul Baha. In 1904, fresh adversities poured out onto Abdul Baha. The covenant breakers had plotted, schemed and planned until a hostile governor replaced the governor who was friendly to Abdul Baha. And when the hostile governor arrived, the covenant breaker roused the uh, elements of the population of Akka who were already opposed to the Baha'is and to Abdul Baha. So they caused trouble, they just stirred up mischief, made, they were elements of chaos. The covenant breakers succeeded through lies and manipulation in getting Abdul Baha indicted. And they bribed influential Akka residents to sign this petition. They sent the indictment to Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And when he read the document, he absolutely panicked. He sent a commission of inquiry. Spies were stationed to watch Abdul Baha's house 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Things were so dangerous in 1904, 1905 
that Abdul Baha sent the Baha'is out of Akka for a time. 1905, the Commission of Inquiry. This is a photograph of Mehmed Arif Bey, the head of the Commission of Inquiry that's coming to inquire on behalf of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. What's going on with Abdul Baha? Is he building a fortress on Mount Carmel to attack us? Is he raising an army? So that's what they're trying to decide because they're uh, really, really... Uh, scared of these rumors that the covenant breakers have been sending to them for four years straight now. 1905, the Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan's commission of inquiry arrived in Akka and assumed control of the city, even disregarding orders from the governor of Syria who governed Akka. They disregarded everyone's orders. They just took over, took over the city. With the assistance of the covenant breakers, they pressured people to testify against Abdu'l-Bahá. So this is not going well. And uh, Shoghi Effendi would be eight years old now. They visited the Shrine of the Bab, which they falsely confirmed in their report was indeed a fortress. They interrogated Abdul Baha three times and they planned to exile him in Fizan, Libya, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, thousands of uh, kilometers and miles away from Akka, in the middle of the Sahara Desert. In the end, the Commission of Inquiry was urgently recalled to Istanbul after an attempt on the life of the Sultan. So they left and they did not come back. 1906 and 1908, Abdul Baha reveals his will and testament. During this time of great danger in 1906 and 1908, when Abdul Baha was surrounded by plots, enemies, and real threats against his life, he did not think he would survive. This is very important. This is years before his passing, years before Abdul Baha's ascension, uh, 10, 20 years, 22 years, 24 years before his ascension, Abdul Baha thought he was going to die. And so he wrote his last will and testament. That's what prompted him to write the will and testament of Abdul Baha was, I am not going to live through this storm. So he revealed his will and testament in two parts, in 1908, 1906 and 1908, and he named Shoghi Effendi as guardian of the cause and his successor. Shoghi Effendi at the time was nine and 11 years old. A childhood marred by limitations. This is to emphasize uh, the Spartan conditions of his childhood. I took a black and white photo of the house of Abdullah Pasha. Shoghi Effendi was born in a family that was imprisoned in Akka. So Effendi, as I said before, was born a prisoner. They were prisoners of the Ottoman Empire and with their station as prisoners came a Spartan lifestyle imposed by the limitations upon Abdul Baha and his family by their enemies in the Ottoman government. The relentless life of imprisonment and their constant attack on his beloved grandfather would affect the character of Shoghi Effendi for life. He became used to deprivations in his childhood and later in his life would continue to manifest this quality by his rigorous, self-imposed, self-discipline and carefulness with spending money. Forever after his childhood, Shoghi Effendi would never indulge in non-essentials. He would possess a capacity for financial stringency and economy that set him apart from others, all the while showing immense generosity to people who weren't him. It was a dual side. He would spend no money on himself, only travel in third class, go to the most modest uh, hotels, but he was very generous with Baha'is and Baha'i communities. Shoghi Effendi's childhood during the last years of the Ottoman Empire. What you have here is a large Palestinian crowd outside Jaffa's Grand Sarai, housing the local government offices to celebrate the revolution in Constantinople, well, Istanbul, known by the Arabs as al huriya Arabic for liberty, and declared by the Young Turks, who it was the Young Turk Revolution. They called for the restoration of the constitution, and for a new parliament. Added to the sufferings endured by the family of the master because his enemies, of his enemies within the faith, 
Shoghi Effendi had a difficult child in a material sense as well. In his childhood and youth, Shoghi Effendi witnessed the end of an era in Ottoman-ruled Palestine, which had been overrun by tyranny and had been plagued by a deeply corrupt government, had been the victim of serious epidemics, had been subjected to utter, utter poverty. In a conversation with Ugo Giacchieri half a century later, so over 50 years later, Shoghi Effendi would recall to him the difficulties of growing up in the last years of the Ottoman Empire. And now these are, of course, pilgrim notes because they are Ugo Giacchieri recalling what Shoghi Effendi told him in a conversation. But these are the words of Shoghi Effendi as Ugo Giacchieri remembers them. Speaking about himself, of course, there were no opportunities available in those years because the collapse of the military, cultural, political structure of the Ottoman Empire was at hand. And the signs of the imminent disintegration of the last vestiges of an ancient glory were evident even to my young eyes. The signs of the imminent disintegration of the last vestige of an ancient glory were evident even to my young eyes. Sorry, guys. Okay. Shoghi Effendi's childhood as a, as a child, part one. Now, Shoghi Effendi as a child, part one, began here with his boundless energy, his physical traits, his courteous nature, his family, holy family's breakfast. And then I made a pause to uh, talk about his childhood suffering. And now we're resuming so Shoghi Effendi as a child, part two, with lunch in Abdul Baha's house. And so this photograph here is uh, a room in Abdul Baha, in uh, Abdullah Pasha. When lunchtime arrived, all the Baha'i pilgrims and many resident believers would gather at the house of Abdullah Pasha to eat and hear Abdul Baha speak. A pitcher of warm water was placed on the table so the guests could wash their hands with soap. Abdul Baha poured the water on their hands and Shoghi Effendi stood next to his grandfather handing each guest a fresh, clean towel. Some of the Baha'is were clever and washed both their hands and face. After everyone was seated at the table, Abdul Baha served them food, looked after their needs. One day, when Dr. Habib Muayyad was present, Abdul Baha told the friends, the believers must be servants to the world of humanity. They must be kind to one another, nay, sacrifice themselves for others. They must not just love their friends, but should also be kind to their enemies and indeed count them as friends. Since these people have not drunk from the chalice of divine love, they know not such sentiments. But since you have been raised under the shadow of the bounties of the ancient beauty, you must be a true servant to each member of humanity, not just by your true words, but by your very conduct and from the depth of your soul, your heart and belief. You should do so not because people may recognize your good deeds, but because the blessed beauty has wished it and it meets his good pleasure. Shoghi Effendi's relationship to prayers as a child. This is also from the Priceless Bro. While Shoghi Effendi was still a baby, Abdul Baha called one of the Muslims who chanted in the mosque to come once a week and chant the sublime verses of the Quran in his melodious voice to Shoghi Effendi. As a young child, Shoghi Effendi memorized and chanted tablets revealed by Abdul Baha after Baha'u'llah's ascension with tears streaming down his little face. One day, a Western pilgrim asked Abdul Baha to reveal a prayer for children. The first one to memorize it was Shoghi Effendi who would chant it in meetings. Many of the members of the Holy Family, including Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi's mother, Zia Yehanum, had very beautiful voices when chanting prayers. And this aspect of family culture deeply offended, uh, affected Shoghi Effendi, who would chant prayers until the end of his life. So we're coming to the second um, vignette of a book that I want to introduce you to, which is a book that I just... I love with all my heart. It's a book by Riaz Khadem, Dr. Riaz Khadem. And it's called Prelude to the Guardianship. There is no specialist alive today more knowledgeable about Shoghi Effendi's early years than 
Dr. Riaz Khadem. His pioneering historical research should be introduced here before the first story that draws on this book. The next story comes from Dr. Riaz Khadem's Prelude to the Guardianship, which was first published many years ago as Shoghi Effendi in Oxford. For almost three decades, starting with Shoghi Effendi in Oxford in 1999, then with Prelude to the Guardianship, published 15 years later in 2014, Dr. Riaz Khadem has all opened the Baha'i world's eyes to the most important formative moments of Shoghi Effendi, his childhood, his schooling, his time with his beloved grandfather, Abdul Baha, his studies in Beirut, his travels to Egypt to meet the master, his almost journey to the United States cut short by the evil Dr. Farid, his time as Abdul Baha's secretary in 1918, 1920, his rest in Paris, France, his first few terms at Oxford before hearing of the tragic passing of Abdul Baha and his early moments as guardian. We will cover all of these in the chronology. Dr. Riaz Khadem's peerless work of research into the archives of the American University of Beirut and Oxford University offer something exceedingly unique in Baha'i history, a thorough, detailed, intricate view of the little known parts of Shoghi Effendi's life before he became the guardian. This book is published by George Ronald. This is also a lifelong trait for Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha's love, uh, Shoghi Effendi's love of learning. Another photograph of a young Shoghi Effendi with a fez, and it goes down to his beautiful leather booties as well. Also from the Priceless Pearl, also those intense eyes, which from birth are his, his distinguishing characteristic, physical characteristic. One day when he was still a very small child, Shoghi Effendi entered Abdul Baha's room, picked up his pen and tried to write. Abdul Baha gently drew Shoghi Effendi in, tapped him on the shoulder and told his serious little grandson, the future guardian, now is not the time to write. Now is the time to play. You will write a lot in the future. Because Shoghi Effendi had such an insatiable desire to learn, Abdul Baha instituted classes in his home, some of which were taught by the veteran defender of the cause, Haji Mir Zahid Dar Ali. At one point in Akka, Shoghi Effendi and Abdul Baha's other grandchildren were taught by an Italian governess. Shoghi Effendi's early life. This is another photograph by one of my favorite Baha'i photographers, Chad Mauger, who his Flickr page is linked to every image um, that of his that I use. These are images that are copyrighted by Chad, and I use them with his permission in this chronology. They are the open shutters of the Bahji Pilgrim House, where Shoghi Effendi sometimes stayed the night as a child. Shoghi Effendi's early years were spent in the prison city of Akka, enclosed by moats and walls, its two gates guarded by sentries. When his beloved grandfather was reincarcerated, tensions were high and danger was everywhere because of the incessant plottings of the covenant breakers. But these restrictions did not mean Shoghi Effendi could not move around. He had many occasions to visit the homes of resident Baha'is in Akka, visit the Khane Avami, the Inn of the Pillars, the Caravanserai where the pilgrims were housed, and enjoy the Garden of Rizvan, often in the company of his beloved Abdul Baha. Shoghi Effendi also traveled to Beirut, the only large city in the region with his family. Shoghi Effendi sometimes slept in the pilgrim house at Bahji, the shutters you see here. Uh, because he couldn't sleep in the mansion of Bahji because it was occupied by covenant breakers. When he did sleep over at the pilgrim house at Bahji with Abdul Baha, Abdul Baha himself would come and tuck in his grandchild in bed saying, I need him. Shoghi Effendi Rabani. This is also a photograph from Priceless Pearl. Although his grandson's name was Shoghi, Abdul Baha invariably called him Shoghi Effendi and commanded everyone, including Shoghi Effendi's father, to add the title after his name. So no one was to call him Shoghi. The, tame, the term Effendi means sir and is added after a first name to mark respect. Abdu'l-Baha to the non-Baha'is in Akka 
was known throughout Akka and Haifa as Abbas Effendi, not Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was the way Baha'is referred to him. He was known as Abbas Effendi, and Shoghi was Shoghi Effendi. One day, Shoghi Effendi asked Abdul Baha to give him a surname. Until then, he was Afnan, like all the other Afnans. Afnan, Afnan, Afnan. But he wanted a name of his own. So he asked Abdul Baha to give him a surname. Abdul Baha gave Shoghi Effendi the surname Rabbani, which means divine, a name that was later adopted by his brothers and sisters. So his first name Shoghi means one who longs, and his last name Rabbani means divine. Nineteen oh six, nineteen oh seven, Shoghi Effendi school years. Around nine July, nineteen oh six, Shoghi Effendi on a donkey. Okay, I have to explain something here. Those of you who've been with me for a year know that I am obsessed with donkeys, and I love to put donkey stories in every chronology if possible. So that's one reason that this story is here. The second reason, more important, is that. Baha'u'llah had two donkeys, thunder and lightning, two white donkeys sent to him from Persia, which gave Baha'u'llah freedom to travel around the Druze villages in Palestine. These donkeys were important to Baha'u'llah. They gave him independence. And also, Abdul Baha rode donkeys. This is a photograph of Abdul Baha riding a donkey. The third reason why I put this donkey story in the chronology, because I received an email asking me, why did you put this email in there? Because it's not a very interesting story. But I put it in for a very good reason. I, I write these chronologies and I put in stories that move me and that act as disruptors to me. Like I had never ever in my life imagined that Shoghi Effendi the Guardian had ever ridden a donkey in his entire life. And when I read this story, it kind of shook my preconceived notion of Shoghi Effendi. And so I decided to put it in the chronology even though it is literally only a story about Shoghi Effendi riding a donkey. But there is another aspect to this chronology is I have tried very, very, very hard to find stories that are not common so that your intimacy with Shoghi Effendi will be um, intensified. Your connection with the Guardian will be strengthened because you see him differently, because you're hearing stories you haven't heard before. And so this is a story that I'd never heard and I liked it and I that's why I put it in. And it's staying. I'm not taking it out. There you go. So this is a photograph of Abdul Baha on a donkey. During the hot summers, Shoghi Effendi and his family would sometimes stay in a summer home higher up the mountain on Mount Carmel than Haifa was at the bottom. Sometime around 9 July 1906, after they had been on pilgrimage for 33 days, Florence and Ali Kuli Khan were preparing to leave Haifa and had just visited the Shrine of the Bab for the last time. As they were making their way down Mount Carmel, suddenly, out of the shadows, nine-year-old Shoghi Effendi appeared, riding a donkey. He had managed to convince his tutor to let him ride down the mountain from their summer home to meet the Khan's carriage so that he could say goodbye to them one last time. Nineteen oh six, Jane White and the Unforgettable Boy. This, my friends, is the very first picture in the chronology that was uh, given permission for me to use by the United States National Baha'i Archives. It's a rare photo of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah in the late eighteen nineties. I thought it would be very interesting to put this here because this story takes place in the shrine. Jane White, a Scottish Christian, had come on pilgrimage in March 1906 with Mrs. Thornburg Cropper, the first British Baha'i. She had been convinced to accept the invitation even though she wasn't a Baha'i because her friend Edward Granville Brown, the famous British Orientalist, told her, certainly do not refuse so great an opportunity. Edward Granville Brown, you will remember, was the only Westerner to meet Baha'u'llah and write about him. Several Westerners met Baha'u'llah, but he was the only one to write about him. 
Jane White spent three days in Akka and was deeply affected. She often wrote about her experience on pilgrimage afterwards and meeting Abdullah. But another thing she wrote about was a scene she never forgot. One day, she saw a young boy kneeling, kneeling in adoration before the threshold of the shrine of Baha'u'llah and the thought crossing her mind, what destiny lies before this boy? The nine-year-old boy was Shoghi Effendi. 1906, 1907, A Dream of the Bob. This is another photo of the room of Abdul Bahan, the house of Abdullah Pasha, in which Shoghi Effendi saw the Bob in his very significant dream. When Shoghi Effendi was nine or 10 years old, living with his nurse in Abdul Baha's house in Haifa and going to the French school, he had a deeply significant dream. In the dream, he and an Arab schoolmate were in Abdul Baha's reception room in the house of Abdullah Pasha in Akka. Then the Bob entered the room and a man with a gun appeared and shot at the Bob, then told Shoghi Effendi, now it's your turn. The man began to chase Shoghi Effendi around the room to shoot him, and that was when Shoghi Effendi woke up. When he told his nurse about the dream, she told him to tell Mirza Asadullah, who would convey it to his grandfather, Abdul Baha. When Abdul Baha heard about Shoghi Effendi's dream, he revealed a tablet for his grandson. He is God. Shoghi mine. This dream is a very good one. Rest assured that to have attained the presence of His Holiness, the Exalted One, may my soul be a sacrifice to Him, is a proof of receiving the grace of God and obtaining His most great bounty and supreme favor. The same is true of the rest of the dream. It is my hope that you may manifest the outpourings of the Abha beauty and waxed day by day in faith and knowledge, at night pray and supplicate, and in the day do what is required of you. Abdul Baha. Shoghi Effendi had this dream around the time that Abdul Baha was revealing his will and testament, in which he named him his eldest grandson, guardian of the cause. Happened around the same time. This is another story I love. February 1907, Abdul Baha joins the children jumping rope during Corinne Tr and Arna True's pilgrimage. This is a beautiful picture of Corinne True. Corinne True came on pilgrimage for the first time in February 1907. This is a very important date. A very, very, very significant story is going to happen late in the life of the Guardian that has to do with this 1907 pilgrimage by Corinne True. Remember it if you can. It's going to be like in 20 weeks, but it's okay. <laughs> From the moment she came on pilgrimage in 1907, she dedicated her life and soul to Abdul Baha, who loved her very very deeply. Corinne arrived on pilgrimage with her 16-year-old daughter, Arna, who was not having a very good time at all. At lunch one day, obviously sensing her unhappiness, Abdul Baha asked Arna, are you happy? Arna replied, yes, but not very. Her mother, Corinne, cringed at Arna's candor, but Abdul Baha knew just the remedy. He smiled and asked her if she would like to be with the other Persian children of the Holy Family. Abdul Baha's solution was brilliant. <laughs> it didn't matter that the children didn't speak each other's language, that they didn't understand English and Arna didn't understand Persian. Her love for them was all the communication they needed. One day, Arna gathered all the children, including 10-year-old Shoghi Effendi, who had come to Akka for the weekend from his school in Haifa, and Arna taught them all the American games that she knew. One afternoon, the master entered the courtyard and stopped to watch Arna teaching the children how to jump rope. Abdul Baha was impressed. And then Abdul Baha took a turn with the jump rope. Uh huh. Later that year, Shoghi Effendi wrote a letter to Arna, now back in the United States, thanking her for the writing paper she and her mother had given him. This is actually really sweet. This is a story of when this picture was taken. After April, 8 April 1907, the photograph of Shoghi Effendi with his sailor collar. It's a very famous photograph of him. 
This is Shogi Effendi wearing his sailor collar with his sister Ruhangiz and his cousin Ruhi Afnan, both of which, unfortunately, later broke the covenant. Thornton Chase, the first American Baha'i, arrived on pilgrimage in Akka on 8 April 1907 and took a photograph of Shogi Effendi sometime after his arrival, when he was 10 years old, wearing what his usual outfit was in those days, shorts, long dark stockings, uh, leather booties, a fez on his head, a dark fez on his head, a jacket, and a huge sailor collar covering his shoulders. So friends, we've arrived at the last, last section for today. This is 1909-1910, Shogi Effendi in Haifa before his studies in Beirut. And the first story is 1899-1909, Abdu'l-Baha erects the shrine of the Bab. This is also a rare picture from the construction of the Shrine of the Bab, rare picture uh, provided by the United States National Baha'i Archives. The dominating project in his adoring grandfather's life from the time Shoghi Effendi was born until the time he was 12 years old was the erection of the Shrine of the Bab in order to lay to rest the remains of the Bab, a project which spanned the years 1899 to 1909 from the time Shoghi Effendi was two to the time Shoghi Effendi was 12. In 1897, the year Shoghi Effendi was born, Abdu'l-Baha ordered an engraved one-piece marble sarcophagus and a coffin made of the finest Burmese wood from the Baha'i community of Burma, today's Myanmar. The remains of the Bab arrived in the Holy Land in 1890. 1899, after a deeply adventurous journey, which you can read about in Journey to a Mountain by Michael V. Day. For one year, they were hidden in the room of the greatest holy leaf in the house of Abdullah Pasha in Akka. After that year, the casket stayed in one house in Haifa for nine years until Abdu'l-Baha laid to rest the remains of the Bab on Mount Carmel inside the shrine he finished. Abdu'l-Baha purchased the land on Mount Carmel in 1899, when Shoghi Effendi was two, laid the foundation stone shortly thereafter. Then from 1899 to 1908, he built it as a prisoner at a distance from Akka, sending his uh, instructions over to Haifa, supervising the whole construction project from afar. While he was still a prisoner, throughout all the crises that surrounded him, like the commission of inquiry, he kept building. 21st of March, 1909, Shoghi Effendi is present when Abdu'l-Baha lays the Bob's remains to rest. Let me just give you a little bit more room to read that. Here. This is the Shrine of the Bob as it was on the 21st of March, 1909, when Abdu'l-Baha finally interred the remains of the Bob on Mount Carmel after 59 years of dis displacement, after his martyrdom on the 9th of July, 1850. On 21 March, 1909, when he was 12 years old, Shoghi Effendi witnessed Abdu'l-Baha accomplishing one of the three objectives which he had set himself for his ministry, to inter the Bob's remains on Mount Carmel in the shrine he had built at the instruction of Baha'u'llah, who had indicated to him the precise location in June 1891, 18 years prior. Before leaving Akka for Haifa, Abdu'l-Baha gave instructions to the Baha'is to bring the heavy Margot sarcophagus to Mount Carmel. This gorgeous sarcophagus, inscribed in gold letters in verses calligraphied by Mishkin Khalam, had been constructed in Burma in 1897 at Abdu'l-Baha's request and had arrived in Haifa 10 years earlier in 1899. By the light of a single lamp, Abdu'l-Baha removed his turban, his shoes, and his dark outer cloak. Bareheaded and barefoot in simple white garments, Abdu'l-Baha descended into the vault and placed the wooden casket containing the remains of the Bob and his companion in his companion Anis, who had been martyred with him, into the marble sarcophagus. Then he bent low over the casket and wept with such intensity that everyone present cried with him. 
The ebony lid of the coffin was secured. The marble lid of the sarcophagus was closed forever. Abdu'l-Baha chanted the prayer for the dead. Abdu'l-Baha chanted the prayer for the dead. Because this is the first time in 59 years since the Bab was shot and martyred that he is being buried. So this is the first time the prayer for the dead. I mean, this Abdul Baha is 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 burying the Bab. I mean, this is so moving. It's such a Abdul Baha worked so hard. He would later say that every single stone that was raised on this edifice was at the cost of his tears and sorrow and his pain. Soon after this, Abdul Baha wrote to the Baha'is of the world, the most joyful tiding is this, that the holy, the luminous body, having for 60 years been transferred from place to place by reason of the ascendancy of the enemy and from fear of the malevolent and having known neither rest nor tranquility, has through the mercy of the Abha beauty been ceremoniously deposited on the day of no ruse within the sacred casket in the exalted shrine on Mount Carmel. Shoghi Effendi would later describe this event as one of the most outstanding events in the first Baha'i century. You know, we can't, Baha'is cannot be buried more than an hour from the place they die. And the Bab was buried 59 years and thousands of miles from the place he died. An extremely moving event. Between 1906 and 1908, Dr. Afrukte and Haji Mirza Haydar Ali confer about Shoghi Effendi. This is a beautiful photograph. We have here Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, the angel of Carmel, his hand, I think, extending to Shoghi Effendi. I mean, we can't really see. And this is Shoghi Effendi here. This is uh, Mirza uh, Aqa Khosrau, uh, Abdul Baha's faithful gardener, uh, faithful attendant. Uh, and cook, and just a wonderful, wonderful man. And one of the last acts of Abdul Baha's life will be to marry him to his wife. And then he'll die a few days later. I can't remember um, when exactly. But this is Mirza Mahmoudi Zarkani, very faithful Baha'i, who was the secretary of Abdul Baha in America. And uh, he wrote Mahmoud's diary, uh, volume one and volume two, translated by Adim Basumi, and should be out soon. Dr. Yunus Khan Afrukte had a very powerful experience on first meeting Shoghi Effendi. If you remember when he was only four months old, when he first came to the pilgrimage in, for pilgrimage in the Holy Land in 1897, three years later in 1900, he returned to Haifa to serve Abdul Baha for a period of nine years. During this time, he had two more profound experiences, meeting Shoghi Effendi when he was nine years old in 1906 and when he was 11 years old in 1908. So this story took place sometime around these years, 1906-1908. Having had a repeat experience of feeling Shoghi Effendi's spiritual power, Dr. Afrukte went over to talk to his close friend, Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, the great servant of, of Baha'u'llah, who had been imprisoned in the Sudan for years. And he moved uh, in to Haifa in 1903 at Abdul Baha's request to spend the remainder of his life with the master. So this conversation is taking place between Dr. Yunus Khan Afrukte, who has just experienced something with Shoghi Effendi that he can't quite make sense of. It's a very powerful experience. And he goes to the wise, wonderful Haji Mirza Haidar Ali and talks to him. And he finds to his surprise that Haji Mirza Haidar Ali has felt the same experience he felt in Shoghi Effendi's presence. So both Dr. Afrukhte and Haji Mirza Haidar Ali, who were so incredibly firm in the covenant, instinctively knew that not a word of what they had perceived would be safe if it were to come out. So they made a pact, they kind of decided together to keep their experiences to themselves, to protect Shoghi Effendi and to keep Abdul Baha's secret. But what's fascinating about this story is that Dr. Afrukhte and Haji Mirza Haidar Ali perceived Shoghi Effendi's spiritual power at the time, again, when Abdul Baha was revealing his will and testament, naming Shoghi Effendi to be the guardian, and Shoghi Effendi was between 9 and 11 years old. See, there's a lot of spiritual experience that are happening between 1906 and 1908. 
So 1907, 1910, school in Haifa and Beirut. Also from the Priceless Pearl. <laughs> Love this photograph because it's a, one of the few ones where you can see how shiny his hair is and how oh beautiful, it has such a beautiful shape. It falls so beautifully and you can see the part on the side and how thick it is. And there's no fez in the middle of his forehead, you know? So beautiful. He's holding flowers, which is a nice um, sort of parallel to a, the first photograph of him as guardian was he he's holding flowers in a handkerchief. I always imagine these two pictures in my mind. Such a beautiful picture. And there's a picture of him when he's 20, when he's holding a, a flower or a fruit. I can't remember. So he just loved nature, loved flowers. When Shoghi Effendi uh, was a child, Abdul Baha sent him to live in Haifa with a nurse named Hajar Khatun. And he was enrolled in the French Jesuit school, Collège des Frères, uh, Brothers College. Abdul Baha assigned Dr. Habib Muayyad, a very devoted Persian believer, to be Shoghi Effendi's tutor and to look after him. Shoghi Effendi absolutely loved his nurse, Hajar Khatun. Loved that woman so much. And Abdul Baha mentioned her name in a tablet he sent to his beloved sister, Bahia Hanum, the greatest holy leaf, kiss the flower of the garden of sweetness, Shoghi Effendi, and convey greetings to Hajar Khatun. He loved her. Shoghi Effendi's first language after Persian was French. He went to French school and he retained a beautiful accent in French for the rest of his life. Shoghi Effendi was naturally left-handed, but because of the strictness of the Jesuit school, they did this a lot in the, er in, the, in the early 20th century. They forced him to write with his right hand. And that is the reason that Shoghi Effendi has such a distinctive handwriting. It's the left-handed writing of a person writing with his right hand, basically. So, so interesting. By the time Shoghi Effendi was nine or 10, sometime in 19... 06, 1907, Shoghi Effendi had become so deeply unhappy in his French school that Abdul Baha sent him to a Catholic boarding school in Beirut where he was just as unhappy. Now, this is going to be a theme in Shoghi Effendi's life. He was never happy in any school. Um, luckily, Shoghi Effendi came back to Haifa and his grandfather for every vacation. And I think that holds the key to why he was unhappy in school, because he was not with Abdul Baha. And when he was a young child, he was with Abdul Baha all the time because he didn't need to go to school. But then when he got to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way to 20, he had to be sent away to go to school. And that meant not being in the presence of Abdul Baha. And that was always extremely hard for Shoghi Effendi. Abdul Baha tried to remedy the situation by sending a trusted Baha'i woman to Beirut to care for Shoghi Effendi and renting a house there so he could attend school as a day student and not a boarding student, thinking that would make it easier for him. Not long after she arrived, this devoted Baha'i wrote to Shoghi Effendi's parents in Haifa and explained to them that not only was Shoghi Effendi still very unhappy in his school, but he would sometimes refuse. He was so unhappy. He would refuse to attend school for several days. Shoghi Effendi was losing weight and getting run down. Shoghi Effendi's father, Mirza Hadi Shirazi, showed the letter to Abdul Baha, who immediately made arrangements for Shoghi Effendi to enter the preparatory school associated with the Syrian Protestant College, which would later be called the American College in Beirut. Oh, sorry. Just one sentence left. The only saving grace for Shoghi Effendi in these disappointing experiences with schools was that he was able to return to Haifa as often as possible and bask in the presence of his, the grandfather he idolized and yearned to serve. From the very moment he started going to school, he just started yearning to serve Abdul Baha. And this is building up to part three which is the most joyful part of the entire chronology where Shoghi Effendi just serves Abdul Baha. That's a week after next. So, 1907, 1910, lunch in the house, in the time of Abdul Baha. This is a beautiful picture of the house of the master today. 
This little vignette just takes place before Abu Baha left for his journeys to the West and after he moved to Haifa permanently. There was a member of Abdul Baha's household, A.M. Kuli, whose function it was to tell Abdul Baha the time. <laughs> Sorry, that's just so cute. Every day at around 11 a.m. in the morning, Abdul Baha would enter the great hall of the house and ask, Kuli, Sachandi. Kuli, what time it is? What time is it? Then the maids would set up for lunch. After laying down a large cloth on the floor of the old tea room, they placed a huge low-legged table on it and set enamel plates down along with spoons and bread. Abdul Baha would sit down and call out, Bi Abishnid, come and sit down to his family. Depending on the food, they would eat with their hands or with spoons, you know, if it was soup. And Abdul Baha served rice to the family members. The seat next to Abdul Baha was always reserved for Bahia Hanum, the greatest holy leaf. And she would enter about halfway through lunch and bring a plate of food. Generally, uh, gradually, as Abdul Baha finished eating, other people would enter, women, guests, or children, and his daughters. The second lunch was much more raucous and noisy than the first lunch was. Abdul Baha's lunch was very quiet, very uh, dignified, no kids. <laughs> and then the greatest holy leaf comes in halfway through, and then it's the second shift for lunch, and it's all the kids. <laughs> All the noise, <laughs> everybody talking. <laughs> so um, the children would cry, everyone would talk. But the one thing all the grandchildren were watching out for was the mouthful of the greatest holy leaf's food, which she would give to one or the other of her great nephews or nieces. Because all the children said that her food tasted the best, and they called it the mouthful of Hanum. Shoghi Effendi was usually the one who got to eat it, because, of course, he was also her favorite. Once the ladies and the children of the household had eaten, it was the servant's turn at the same table. Then lunch would be cleared and everything, including the large round table, rolled back and put away in its place. Once Abdul Baha returned from his journeys to the West, more Western ways of eating were introduced, like ceramic plates instead of enamel, chairs and cutlery instead of sitting on the ground, eating with your hands. So it changed a little bit after 1913. Around, 19, around January 1908, Abdul Baha sends Shoghi Effendi to Haifa when Akka became, becomes too dangerous. A very pensive Shoghi Effendi, also from the Priceless Pearl. Abdul Baha did everything to make sure Shoghi Effendi had a happy and carefree childhood, but his grandson was very sensitive and deeply intelligent, and Abdul Baha could not hide from him the great dangers that threatened him in the last days of the Ottoman Empire. In the previous three years, Abdul Baha had received the visit of a commissioning of inquiry sent by the Sultan as a result of the malicious lies of the covenant breakers. Akka and the house of Abdullah Pasha were filled with an atmosphere of great anxiety that had repercussions inside the Holy Family. Shoghi Effendi would later tell his wife, Amatul Baha Riya Hanum, that even though he was a young boy of 11 at the time, he realized the danger his grandfather was in. Mary and Jack... A Canadian Baha'i arrived in Akka in late 1907 and taught English to the Holy Family, including Shoghi Effendi. It was during this time that Abdul Baha began calling Marion Jack General Jack. And General Jack, Marion Jack, would go on to serve Shoghi Effendi very faithfully during his ministry. Abdul Baha was under constant surveillance because of the incessant rumor mongering of the jealous covenant breakers, and he once again suspended visits by Western pilgrims. The situation became so dire that Abdul Baha sent his eldest grandson, Shoghi Effendi, to live in Haifa. He sent him away from Akka to live in Haifa. And Abdul Baha gave strict instructions to Shoghi Effendi not to drink coffee in the home of any Baha'is for fear he might be poisoned. Why coffee? Because coffee is bitter. Most poison is bitter and coffee masks the poison. So don't drink coffee in the homes of any of the Baha'is. 1909, Shoghi Effendi mourns the death of his beloved nurse, Hajar Khatun, who we just talked about. This is Shoghi Effendi with his, Shoghi Effendi here with his father and his siblings. The entire Holy Family knew that Shoghi Effendi was deeply 
devoted to his beloved nurse, Hajar Khatun, with whom he had moved to Haifa for his own safety. Hajar Khatun had essentially raised Shoghi Effendi, brought him up at the least. Shoghi Effendi's mother, Ziyahe Hanum, had dismissed the elderly Hajar Khatun when Shoghi Effendi was nine or 10 and Shoghi Effendi had bitterly resented it. When Shoghi Effendi was 12 years old around 1909, he was in his father's garden, which his father called Karm, he called his garden Karm, C-A-R-M, when he received the news that Hajar Khatun had passed away in Iskenderun, Turkey, and he sought out a dark place so he could cry for his nurse. So, um, I know that you are all very, very familiar with the story of the Western doctor that comes to the house. It's at the, the page one, I think, of uh, Priceless Pearl, and it's the last story for today, the uh, penultimate story for today. There's one more story after this, the actual story. You know, the German doctor, and she was actually not German, she's Swiss, uh, who came to heal someone and she had this very significant conversation with uh, Abdul Baha about Shoghi Effendi's future station in the faith. I want to talk to you a little bit about who this woman was because we 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 tell this story over and over again, but we never uh, we don't know who she was, and she was actually a really important woman. Her name was Doctor Josefina Teresa Zucher Falchir. Oh, sorry, I'm going to stay on this for you. I'm going to leave the name up too because it's a complicated name, and she has a Wikipedia page. So if you write down her name or if you go to the chronology, you'll find um, you'll find information on her. So undoubtedly. This story that follows this one is the most important story in this first part of the chronology. Um, it's the conversation between Abdul Baha and Dr. Josefina Teresa Zurcher Falchir. Dr. Falchir was an extraordinary woman. She made medical history as one of the very first PhDs in medicine in Switzerland. And she was one of the very first medics in the Ottoman Empire. And she deserves to be properly introduced, um, not just that German lady who talked to Abdul Baha. No, she deserves a, a story in this chronology uh, because she was a witness of a deeply significant event in, in Shoghi Effendi's early life, namely Abdul Baha's literally mentioning to her that he was to be her successor, something he never would have done with a Baha'i. Josefina Teresa Zurcher was born on October 1st, 1866 in Zurich. When she was 20 years old, she began to study medicine at the University of Zurich, and she was the fifth woman who registered for the state exam to become a medic in 1891. She was among the first women to obtain a doctorate in medicine in Switzerland, and her advisor was Dr. Auguste Forel, who in 1921 would receive one of the most significant tablets ever written by Abdul Baha, the tablet to Dr. Forel. He would become a Baha'i, and he would teach the faith until he died. The day he died, I think, he taught the faith, and he was her advisor. In May 1897, Dr. Falchir left Switzerland for San Lufa in the Ottoman Empire. This was how Dr. Falchir described herself in the late 19th century as one of the only female doctors in the entire Ottoman Empire from the Wikipedia page. Go read it. It's really fascinating. She's a really interesting woman. At that time, a female doctor was still something unheard of in the kingdom of the sublime port. The sublime port is another way to say the Ottoman Sultan. In any case, I was attracted to live beyond the traditional paths of life and the usual scenery, far from civic comfort and social obligations, foregoing career, economic situation, and compromises of unrestricted devotion to the profession I love. She is just a role model for women. I mean, I love this woman. A year after arriving in San Lurfa, Josephine and her husband Henry traveled to Aleppo, Syria, and Josephine became the only European medic in the entire region of Syria. By 1905, Dr. Falchir had moved to Haifa, where her husband Henry had been offered a job. Because she was such an excellent doctor, Josephine soon became the physician for the city of Haifa, surrounding villages, and the Baha'i community. This is how she was called to the house of Abdul Baha in Haifa to treat a servant on the 6th of August, 1910. And this is the last story for part one of this chronology, 6th August, 1910, my future Elisha. There are very few records of how people who were not Baha'is saw Abdul Baha and his grandson Shoghi Effendi. 
Dr. Josefina Teresia Zurche Falchir noted her impressions very in a very detailed manner. Uh, when she was called on 6th of August, 1910, to attend the cut finger of a maid at Seven Haparsim, the house of the master. Once she had attended to her patient, Dr. Falchir sipped coffee with the ladies of the Holy Family. Then she was summoned by Abdul Baha to the drawing room. Abdul Baha inquired about the maid, and Dr. Falchir reassured him. Shohi Effendi, then 13 years old, entered the room behind his father and greeted his beloved grandfather with a kiss on the hand, then remained motionless near the door, respectful and humble. People came and went, speaking in Persian for 15 minutes, but Dr. Falchir didn't take her eyes off the boy. Shoghi Effendi was dressed in European summer clothes, a short jacket, shorts, and socks above his knees. The preceptive physician was struck by Shoghi Effendi's dark, already mature and melancholy eyes set in a childish face. Before leaving the room, his father whispered something to Shoghi Effendi, who then approached Abdul Baha, waited to be spoken to, and answered in Persian. Abdul Baha laughed, dismissed him, and Shohi Effendi kissed his grandfather's hand again and walked backwards out of the room, his dark, loyal eyes never leaving Abdul Baha's. A short, moments followed, um, a short moment of silence followed, and Abdul Baha asked Dr. Falshir, Now, my daughter, how do you like my future Elisha? Dr. Falshir responded, Master, if I may speak openly, I must say, but in this boy's face are the dark eyes of a sufferer, one who will suffer a great deal. Abdul Baha looked away. And then, after a long time, turned back to Dr. Falshir and said, My grandson does not have the eyes of a trailblazer, a fighter or a victor. But in his eyes, one sees deep loyalty perseverance, and conscientiousness. And do you know why, my daughter, he will fall heir to the heavy inheritance of being my vazir? Vazir meaning minister, literally, but also occupant of a high post. Baha'u'llah, the great perfection, blessed be his words, in the past, the present, and forever, shows this insignificant one to be his successor, not because I was the firstborn, but because his inner eye had already discerned on my brow the seal of God. Before his ascension into eternal light, the blessed manifestation reminded me that I too, irrespective of primogenitor or age. Primogenitor means firstborn or age. Must observe among my sons and grandsons whom God would indicate for his office. My sons passed to eternity in their tenderest years. In my line, among my relatives, only little shogi has the shadow of of a great calling in the depth of his eyes. Abdul Baha paused for a long time before continuing. At the present time, the British Empire is the greatest and is still expanding in its language, is a world language. My future vazir shall receive the preparation for his weighty office in England itself, after he has obtained here in Palestine a fundamental knowledge of the Oriental languages and the wisdom of the East. Dr. Falchir interjected, Will not the Western education, the English training, remold his nature, confine his versatile mind in the rigid bonds of intellectualism? 
stifle through dogma and convention, his oriental irrationality and intuition so that he will no longer be a servant of the almighty, but rather a slave to the rationality of the Western opportunism and the shallowness of everyday life? Abdul Baha marked another long pause, then rose and spoke in a strong and solemn voice. I am not giving my Elisha to the British to educate. I dedicate and give him to the Almighty. God's eyes watch over my child in Oxford as well, inshallah. That's it for part one of the Guardian Chronology. Please come back next week for part two. It's very exciting. It's all of the times that Shoghi Effendi as a child went to Egypt to meet his beloved grandfather and then his studies at Syrian Protestant College at the University of Beirut. It's so exciting. So see you next week. And I want to, again, thank Immersive Ocean and the Baha'is of Clearwater, Florida for being willing to put in so many hours for hosting this long series. I love you guys so much. Uh, I love being on your team. And so thank you and see you next week.